Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck and a very warm welcome back to Friday Fretworks. And this week, we're taking a look at an amp that was unquestionably pivotal in shaping the sound of rock and roll guitar. Yet, an amp that over the years has been shrouded in speculation, myth and secrecy, and only very recently has the actual truth of which come to light. The album, Led Zeppelin 1. The guitarist, Jimmy Page. The guitar, a 1959 Telecaster. And the amp, well, we'll come to that. For an album as hugely influential as Led Zeppelin 1, both on popular music and of course guitarists the world over, it should be a very little surprise just how much speculation there has been over the years in regard to the gear that was used on that record. A famously vague, shall we say, to be kind when it comes to disclosing the specifics of his gear, Jimmy Page himself has only really added fuel to the fire over the decades with several fleeting references of either small amps in the studio or a Supro combo with a 12-inch speaker. Now, armed with these tantalizing, if somewhat misleading bits of information, Zeppelin fans the world over have set about trying to track down what amp was used on not only the entirety of Led Zeppelin 1, but, crucially, arguably the most iconic solo of all time, Stay Away to Heaven, taken from Led Zeppelin 4. Now, whether deliberately misleading or not, Jimmy referring to such an amp with those specifications was only really half the story. And after decades of Zeppelin fans forensically poring over studio photos with blurry, low-res, almost Bigfoot-esque sightings of this mythical beast, it would take until January of 2019, almost 50 years to the date from the release of Led Zeppelin 1, for the final pieces of the jigsaw puzzle to finally fall into place with the release of the Sun Dragon, an exact recreation of the amp that Jimmy used. But what was it? Now, for those unfamiliar with Jimmy's history pre-Led Zeppelin, to say that he was a prolific session guitarist would be somewhat putting it mildly, with Jimmy being credited on any number of classic 60s tracks, from Shirley Bassey's Goldfinger to Petula Clark's Downtown to Joe Cocker's With A Little Help From My Friends. Now, we don't know a great deal about the gear that he used during this period, but what we do know is that in 1961, his friend, mentor, and renowned guitarist in his own right, Albert Lee, convinced Jimmy to buy not only a Les Paul Custom, but a 1959 Supro Combo, as Albert explains here. Every night we weren't on the road, we play in a little coffee bar in London where a lot of musicians used to come, and Jimmy Page used to come down, we were about the same age. He'd come down and he'd, he would sit in too. You know, we'd go to each other's house and play records and we were really into it, you know, listening to all these great American players. Eventually, he, I mean, he loved my Les Paul and my, and my Supro so much, he went and bought the same rig and it, I believe he used that amp on the on a lot of the, the Zeppelin records. While Albert bought its bigger brother with a single 15 inch speaker, Jimmy purchased the smaller 1690 T Supro Coronado with two 10 inch speakers and added tremolo circuit. Clearly enamored with his purchase, Jimmy used the amp extensively until it fell out of the back of an ambulance, no less. The touring transport of choice for Neil Christian and the Crusaders, a band that Jimmy was playing in at the time. As Perry Margaloof explains, Perry Margaloof being the guitar collector and producer, that persuaded Jimmy to do a reissue of this amp. It had to be put back together again. It was a bit like Humpty Dumpty. 
It's unknown where exactly the amp went to be pieced back together, but thanks to the Sun Dragon, we do, at least for the most part, know what was done to it to get it up and running again. The original 5.4V rectifier tube being replaced with a Mullard GZ34 and the 12X7 preamp tubes again being replaced with Mullard ECC83s, a British made readily available alternative, much the same as various other components throughout the amp that were replaced to get it up and running again. Miraculously, the original GE6L6 power tubes remained, but crucially, those two original 10-inch speakers, more than likely damaged in the fall, were replaced with a single 12-inch Oxford speaker. That's kind of where the confusion around the specs of this amp arise. That, at some point in its life, had been reconed with a pulse sonic cone. The amp was also biased cold, significantly reducing its headroom, meaning that it essentially breaks up at lower volumes. I guess the ultimate result of which was a true hybrid of American and British amp technology. American design, but with kind of a lot of British replacement parts that were readily available at the time. Mitch Colby, the renowned amp designer that was tasked with recreating this amp for Led Zeppelin 1's 50th anniversary, has been incredibly generous with his time and expertise knowledge across various interviews that he's done, outlining the incredibly laborious process that went into recreating this amp, save for one component that he's referenced that at least on paper, shouldn't have made a difference to its sound, but in actual fact was the one component that really helped nail the sound of that original amp. Whether or not we'll ever find out what the component is, I guess again is always going to be a matter of speculation, but what we do know is that in January of 2019, Sundragon released 50 very limited edition amps that were hand numbered and hand signed by Jimmy Page himself up for sale for a cool $12,500 and unsurprisingly sold out in just over a day. Thankfully, later on in the year, they released a version for $3,875, ostensibly the same amp, but with a few cost-cutting parts and kind of building procedures. And that's exactly what I have here today, very kindly on loan from Vintage and Ray Guitars in Bath in the UK. Sounds a little bit like this. <laughs>
immense success of Led Zeppelin 1, released in January of 69, the band concluded their second tour of that same year in only May, finishing up with two sold-out nights at New York's Fillmore East. Upon the conclusion of the second show, their record label Atlantic threw them a party, not only presenting them with a gold record for Led Zeppelin 1, but telling them that they would love to get a follow-up to that album in stores by the end of that year. And as such, the recording process of Led Zeppelin 2 is a real mishmash of locations, techniques and equipment, especially relative to Led Zeppelin 1, which is recorded exclusively at Olympic Studios in Barnes in London. Live, the Supra was neither big enough nor reliable enough, frankly, at this point to take out on tour, and consequently Jimmy experimented with various amp brands in the coming years, being seen with Fenders, Marshall, Hi Watt, Vox, and Orange amps at various points. And subsequently, it wasn't to be until 1971 when that little Supra combo was to make another appearance, this time again being paired with a 59 Telecaster to put down one of the most, if not the most iconic solo of all time. Instead their way to heaven on Led Zeppelin 4. It's somewhat ironic to think of the man that near single-handedly pioneered this quintessential image of a Les Paul wielding, dragon-suited, wall of martial rock star, actually put down two of his most iconic moments on a Telecaster and a Supro combo. As ever, I'm Chris Buck. This is Friday Fretworks. Thank you very much for watching and bearing with me in recent weeks. Please subscribe at the bell icon if you haven't already, and I shall see you next week for another episode. Cheers, guys. Take care. See you soon.